month we did the planetarium on the seasonal sky situation for the autumn and we talked about telescopes um, in February so for practical astronomy I'm going to talk about visual observing obviously the alternative is astrophotography so um, obviously the first observing in telescopes was done visually because the telescope was invented long before the camera so a lot of the early scientific work of astronomy was just done somebody looking at the eyepiece estimating brightnesses um, positions all that kind of stuff they all, basically all the info they could get until the um, spectrometer was invented and an understanding of a spe spectra came about um, amateurs can still do useful stuff visually today not just looking at things but um, you can still do star brightness estimations for the AAVSO and uh, that's because the big observatories, even the survey ones, their telescopes are too big to um, do anything on the really bright stars and there's quite a lot of variable stars that are, are too bright for them so the um, amateur doing visual observations can still get valuable data Okay, so we better look at the eye first. So the eye can be thought of as a camera, in fact. You've got the um, protective cover, the cornea, transparent cover, and then the iris, which has a pupil in it that is variable, so the aperture can open and close. And then behind the iris is suspended via a system of muscles as the lens. And those muscles focus the lens, deform the lens and adjust the focus. So um, when you get older like me, you don't have as much flexibility in the lens, so that's why I have to wear reading glasses. Um, it's harder as you get older to focus closer. Um, common condition for most people as they get older. Um, there are other defects that can occur that are more serious, but anyway, and the actual sensor, if you like, is the retina, which is at the back of the eye. And noted there, you see the optic nerve running out of the eye, and also an area called the macula and the fovea. Those are the areas where your eyes are most sensitive and have the highest resolution. And uh, also they are most densely packed with the type of cell called a cone cell, which is the colour receptor in your eye. So if we look at that in a bit more detail, you can see shown there are rods and cones. And this th shows three different types of cone cells. Um, they're sensitive, they're like a broadband sensor um, in a camera, and it shows red, green, and blue. Some people may lack one of these, and that's called colour blindness. So you may not be able to distinguish some colours because of that. For astronomy, it generally doesn't matter because we're not looking at a lot of things where colour is important with your eyes because there's not enough light. You can see colour in maybe a, a few really bright planetary nebula and planets, and that's about it. Everything else in astronomy visually is, is sort of different levels of grey. So um, it's kind of interesting that it seems a little bit weird I don't know if the pointer will work on this or not. Uh, it's not. Oh, yeah, there it is. Notice that the front of the retina has got blood supply, which seems a bit weird because the um, the light sensitive cells are behind that and behind these um, ganglia that connect up to the nervous system. Apparently, um, mollusks like um, octopus don't have that arrangement, they have the, the, the uh, light sensitive cells on the front and all the blood supply and nerves at the back. So it's kind of interesting, but all, all vertebrates have it this way round, including us. Anyway, we can move on to the next one. So this is um, an example of colour blindness. If you can't see 74, then you've suffering from one of the most common forms of colour blindness and if so and you didn't know you'd better talk to your optometrist and get you what's that you can't see 74 
<laughs> okay. Right, so for astronomy, a really important thing is adaptation. Obviously, um, you notice when if you're in a brightly lit room, somebody turns the lights off. It's, you can't see a thing initially. It's really black. But there might be a few LEDs or something around the place um, on power switches or whatever. And after a while, you can start to see things, and that's because your eyes are gradually adapting. And the, the first thing is that the iris allows to the pupil to expand. And that's the obvious physical thing. It lets in more light. So it's like a camera increasing the aperture value so it becomes more sensitive to light and you get a shorter exposures and that kind of thing. But another change starts to occur in your retina where um, the pigment that works really well in faint light called um, visual purple starts to build up and your colour vision slowly goes away. So there's, in low light conditions, the rod cells we mentioned earlier, they are very sensitive to light. Once they're allowed to adapt, it takes about half an hour to become properly adapted um, when you go from fairly bright light to, to dark. And if you're in the city doing observing, you'll never get properly dark adapted just because there's too much ambient light around from sky glow. So um, full dark adaptation you really only happens when you're under rural sky situation and when there's no bright moon as well because the, um, the full moon, uh, you probably noticed, um, is probably worse than the light pollution of Auckland City. Um, oh, another thing mentioned at the end there that I should just say is that again, another problem with age is that your pupil will not open as widely as you get older. And apparently for some reason people with blue eyes, um, that effect is less. So brown-eyed people like me, as we get older, we tend to um, lose the ability to open our irises wide. I'm not sure why that is. It's some kind of genetic thing that having a blue-coloured iris seems to affect how wide the iris can open as well as you get older. That's kind of a strange thing. Okay, that's just a more, bit more about... You can, um, you can think the, the visual purple or rhodopsin, as the levels of it build up, effectively in, increases the efficiency of your rod cells. In terms of a camera sensor, you'd say the quantum efficiency um, increases. Okay. So according to this claim that um, your eyes from fully bright daylight to fully dark adapted um, as a um, sensitivity of difference of 100 million, which seems pretty incredible. Okay, um, and um, something in terms of your diet, um, rhodopsin is actually derived from vitamin A, so if you're low in vitamin A, you may not have enough rhodopsin, but you should seek ne medical advice about any of that sort of thing. Too much vitamin A is toxic, so you don't want to overdo it either. And he here's an example... Um, of a, uh, a cat who's obviously dark adapted on the right and the one on the left is not dark adapted. And cats are probably um, have pretty good night vision because their, their pupils open really wide compared to ours. If you consider the size of their eyes, they, um, their pupils almost cover the entire um, opening of their, between their eyelids. And cats also have a mirror. Oh, that's right. Behind the retina, they have a reflective layer. So any photons that don't get picked up on the first pass, um, the photons get reflected back and there's a second chance at them being detected. And that's why they talk about cats being able to see in the dark. Of course, they can't see in real ab absolute darkness, but their dark adaptation is a lot better than ours. And 
Right, so the, the next things we have to worry about for visual observing is the sky background brightness. Is um, the moon and outdoor light lighting basically? The moon we just we can wait until full moon goes away, um, but um, outdoor lighting is a bit of a problem. We have to go somewhere generally to get away from that. It's worse actually if you have direct lighting. Because even in the city, if your backyard, say, is, there's no street lights you can see or bright lights you can directly see, you've only got the sky glow to contend with. So your eyes will adapt better in that situation than if you've got a bright street light that's within your field of view. So if, you, if there's something you can do, maybe block the street light out or move to a different part of your backyard. I don't recommend a rifle, but... Um, <laughs> could get into trouble but um, yeah so um, the other thing um, apart from the lighting is the seeing and the clarity so this is uh, something to do with the atmosphere itself which will depend on the weather conditions really so seeing is caused by different layers of temperature in the upper atmosphere that causes turbulence and if you didn't know, air has a diffract refractive index, just like glass. And with air, the refractive index varies with temperature and density as well, actually. But the more of a problem is temperature differences. So um, that causes, if you've got air that's turbulent and patches of different temperature, that's going to reduce the seeing. And generally, misty stuff like mist will reduce the clarity. Um, you also have a problem with mist is that you get backscatter if there's any other light sources around. So in Auckland, um, the seeing can actually be quite good for a sea level location. Um, surprisingly enough, um, Grant often measures it up on the uh, research dome there. And the software will often, on a really good night, get down to one second of arc. Um, which is actually better than they get at Mount John. And that's because where they are isn't quite high enough to get over the turbulent layer coming off the mountains. It's much darker there than here, of course, but they actually have more upper air turbulence. Um, not all the time, though. This is certain conditions in Auckland. Usually after a front has gone through and everything settles down, unfortunately, the one second... Um, arc um, seeing doesn't last very long. <laughs> You'd be able to comment on that, Grant. We're just talking about seeing in Auckland getting down as low as one arc second. Yeah, under rare conditions. Yeah. We have had one arc second here in the past. Yeah. Okay. Sky background. Um, this was discussed earlier because. Not only is this a problem for visual observing or photography as well, as Tony was mentioning, the worse the sky background is, the longer, uh, longer total exposure you need to um, basically bring out good images of your subject. Um, basically, the darker the better. And we can measure it. I was asking Steve Henley before about the site. He did own some sky background meters. It was mentioned Alistair has one sitting down the back there. And uh, um, you've still got one, Steve, but the others, we don't know where they are. Have you got... Oh, OK. Yeah, we had a project to measure the sky background over the whole Auckland area. Um, it's not absolutely necessary now because they have satellites that also monitor this, and it's basically monitored every every time the satellite does a pass. And I think there's a website where you can go and look and it will show you the readings. Of course, um, it changes over time as lights get put in. Uh, lights um, like um, sodium, high-pressure sodium lamps get swapped out for LEDs. You'd hope the LEDs would be better because they have better cutoff, but sometimes they have them way too bright. Um, so it depends on how well how good the installation is. The light from LEDs also scatters more because it's got more blue components. 
Yeah, um, it's hard to yeah, you can filter out obviously sodium vapor because it's quite a narrow band. Um, it's sort of a, a, I think it's a double line on the yellow sort of part of the spectrum. Okay, so this is talking about um, there's a, a scale that basically judges how how good your sky is called the Bortle scale. Uh, it goes from 1 to 9. So in a city that will be down by the Sky Tower, I guess, or Times Square in New York, something like that. So, oh, actually, no, um, it says Sky City. They're slightly better than the absolute worst cities in the world. <laughs> so the worst is level 9. Um, you can, From there, the only thing you can see is the moon uh, and planets and maybe a, a handful of really bright stars. And then it works your way down. So urban, suburban transition, probably somewhere out by Grey Lynn or something. And then you get to the um, brighter suburban and then the suburban skies on the further, like probably at home where I live up in Rossay Bay. Uh, it's not too bad looking out over to the east because you've got the gulf out that way. So, yeah, looking sort of on towards the east from there isn't too bad. And then we get to the rural suburban transition, which is the edge of the city, and then to rural skies, and then you keep getting further away. So um, places like Waharau, where we do the dark sky weekend, did somebody say that would be about a Bortle too? Can anyone remember? What, what was the SQM value? Can you remember, Tony? So I think Waharau would probably be a, um, something like a, a type 3. Oh, okay. So that's considered a rural sky. And then you get to somewhere like Parkery Beach up north, which is way, way out of the, the sky dome of the... Um, of any of towns or whatever, and it's, it is as, probably as dark as the outback of Australia, the, uh, that site. And unfortunately, these things change because of developments in um, like Wainui on the northern part of Auckland, where Alistair's property used to be, was quite good semi rural sort of sky. And there's now these huge housing developments. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, Waharau's helped a bit because of the Hunua's um, cut off a lot of the Auckland sky, sky glow. Um, so we've got ambient lighting. I did mention this before. Like if you've got any lights you can directly see that that's going to be bad, like a street light, because if that's in your, if even if it's in the corner of your vision, it'll be affecting your dark adaptation a lot worse than the, than the background sky glow. So you want to try and observe somewhere where there's minimum or no direct ambient light like that. Depending on your situation, you may not be able to avoid it, but um, that's the ideal situation. And, and if you are in a dark area and you, want, you need some light to see what you're doing, try to use red lights, because red has a lesser effect on your dark adaptation than a white or blue, or in lights with blue and green in the spectrum. Um, your eyes tend not to mind red light so much, doesn't destroy the visual purple as badly as the blue and green does. Is that why they had those, um, those camera rooms in, in red? Yeah, you were trying to, um, yeah probably, yeah. Um, it's possibly less, less sensitive to red. Um, yeah, like if you go to the Wahoo Star Party, we usually tell people if they need to bring a torch or anything, cover it with red, red, um, a red film or, or a filter so that it's not um, affecting people too much. Another little trick related to that actually, 
is yeah. if you're using a, a phone or, a, or an iPad or something um, for, your planet, for your planetarium software like Sky Safari, there's usually a trick you can do on an iPhone. You can set an accessibility feature that will turn your phone red. So it's really quite useful. So if you're in a, a dark room... So you're not uh, wrecking your own eyesight yeah. uh, dash and when you're looking at your phone to see what to look at next. So anyone who's known to do that on an iPhone, come and see me after. Um, I think the, some of the apps, some of the apps have night adaption built in, don't they? They do, but the unfortunate thing with that is you do that. So Sky Safari has got a dark, uh, has got a nighttime mode, and you get that in red. But unfortunately, what typically happens is you get your phone out of your pocket. I'm just going to look at Sky Safari, and then you go, oh, now I'm blind, and I've lost all of my um, yeah. night vision. So, so that little accessibility trick. Okay, um, another thing you can do, I mean, if you don't have a phone that won't do that, you could actually put, re you could put, a, you could put a red film over the, over the phone, just get some red cellophane and stick it over the screen or something like that. Mentions at the bottom there. Okay, so I, I did briefly mention seeing and clarity. So one way you can just judge the, the seeing is just to look up at the stars without your telescope. If you see a lot of twinkling going on, looks pretty, but that generally means the seeing is bad. Um, so, um, um, as I mentioned, mist or thin high cloud can reduce the clarity as well because it's going to scatter light. So, um, we can measure the seeing in terms of the best possible resolution you can get in arc seconds and um, if you I don't know if there's anywhere in New Zealand even at high altitude where you get consistent seeing down to one arc se second um, you probably have to go to somewhere like the um, the high desert in Chile uh, sorry oh right yes yeah. it's interesting Antarctica has really good seeing especially at the South Pole <laughs> Take your telescope down there, <laughs> and you yeah, just coming up in June, July, you get um, six months of observing on the trot. <laughs> That's right. It does it. The seeing, I think you've found that you generally will often get better seeing here than they get. <laughs> At Mount John? Yeah, we, we never get very bad seeing here. So it never gets worse than about, well, three out of seconds and we're pretty good. But at Mount John, they um, often get, they will get extreme. So they can get some really still nights and get really good seeing. So you have a big high pressure over the Well, yeah, the yeah, yeah, so it's probably with your own. Yeah, yeah, well, you yeah. just don't want wind for a start. And, and uh, sometimes it can be calm off the surface and high winds, you know, like. I think um, down at uh, Tekapo, the the uh, tourists love seeing the twinkling because we're just um, visually you think, oh, look at all the. But you travel around the world <laughs> to see that. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not so good for astronomy um, because we are looking we are looking at a long using a long focal length generally, and what you see in the eyepiece is the stars will be dancing around, and um, it's not so great for us. Um, it, it not so much. It probably has more of an effect on the clarity than the seeing, because um, you're probably going to get more scattering of light in that situation. Oh, I just um, was just talking about Grant. Um, we can skip over that with the measurement of seeing here. Um, and you've got to, this can be a bit confusing because you might. The seeing might be good, but you look in your eyepiece and it's horrible. 
And that's because there's a difference between the atmospheric seeing and what's going on in your telescope. If you take your telescope from inside a warm house, stick it up um, outside in your backyard, and you think, oh, with no twinkle, it's going to be really good. You look through your eyepiece, you're really disappointed. And the reason is because there's a big temperature difference in between the telescope and particularly the mirrors, which is a large chunk of glass, or if there's a lot of metal in your telescope OTA, um, until that heat is shared and it comes roughly to equilibrium with the air, you're going to get things like tube currents. Um, but like uh, you see in the day, sometimes heat haze, you'll get that boiling off the mirror, um, especially in reflecting telescopes. So you often need to allow time for the t telescope mirror to um, come to equilibrium with the surrounding air. And the best thing for that is actually to get your telescope out. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, get your telescope out in advance of, of actually observing. Um, obviously, you don't want it to leave it in the direct sun, but if it's in the, the, the shade or whatever, um, when the, that area is shaded, you leave it there before you start your observing session when it gets dark. By that time, hopefully, the telescope will have reached equilibrium with the, with the air. Um, often, big telescopes take longer. Obviously, if they've got a really big, massive mirror, uh, it's going to take longer to come to equilibrium. Sometimes um, they will have fans on the back of it to deliberately force cool it by blowing air over the back of the mirror or, or sometimes across the front depending on the arrangement. They say long because of time. Sorry? They say long because of It depends a lot of, on the type of telescope, I think. Can, um, you, can you take a couple of hours? That's a 16-inch Richie Cratian telescope out there. So I think the Zeiss is similar, actually, about two hours. Yeah, it's much better at 16 inches. Yeah. Um, the, some of the ones that are known to be particularly bad are Maxitov's. Because as well as having a big main mirror, they have a really massive meniscus lens that also holds quite a bit of um, heat energy. So um, anyway, I'm just getting just a quick recap of um, basics. We've got the um, incoming light from the objective lens or mirror if it's a reflector. Um, there's a focus. You obviously to observe visually, you have to use an eyepiece generally. Well, it is possible to, um, to see images in prime focus. In fact, I think um, you used to be able to hire the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope and actually sit up in the cage and, and basically observe at prime focus. I don't know whether that's still the case. I know some astronomy groups in the US used to do that. Like the club would hire the telescope for a night and you get a technician to operate it as part of the deal. And you, of course you can use it with an eyepiece as well. Okay, so a few um, definitions. Um, telescope, the key or the most important thing of a telescope is the, the aperture size. And when we talk about apertures with telescope, we're not talking about aperture as they use in photography. The two are sort of the same, but generally with photography with a lens you have a variable aperture and that's basically like your eye, it has an iris uh, in the lens that can close or open to um, basically fit what you want to do, whether you want to in low light, you want to open the, the iris up. If it's really bright you might want to close it down or you might deliberately want to have a shallow depth of field as they do in photography. So you open the aperture right up and then, then the um, area in focus becomes quite short. So you put the background of your subject out of focus so they do all those tricks. But in um, astronomy we don't normally ever stop our telescopes down unless maybe if you're looking at uh, something really bright like the sun or the moon and you or the sun you put a sub-aperture filter with a a stop down telescope. But generally, we use the full opening of the 
telescope aperture for astronomy. And then we have a focal ratio, and that's just the, um, the ratio of the aperture um, divided into the focal length, which is that ft. And then, because we're using it with a, a um, I'm not sure, why is that in there twice? That's probably a mistake, actually. I think fe is meant to be the focal length of the eyepiece, not the telescope. So um, you've got two focal lengths to consider for visual observing, the telescope focal length and the eyepiece focal length. And then there's the apparent field of view. And this is, apparent field of view of an eyepiece is a design issue. When you buy one, it will tell you what the apparent field is. And it might be something like 50 degrees for a plossal design eyepiece. I know um, Astron sell a thing called a GSO Super View. It's got a something like 65 degrees field of view, something like that. And then you get wide angle eyepieces. Generally, the wider the angle, the more expensive the eyepiece because to do that, they need more optical elements. And um, yeah, what, what if you way you can think about it is that if you imagine looking through a, a pipe you're going to have a very narrow apparent field of view and maybe a cone, you can get wider and wider field of view. So um, the apparent field is what it looks like to your eye. So the true field though is the actual chunk of the sky that you can see measured in, in degrees. So for example, the moon has a true field of view of half a degree. So if your telescope sorry, it has a, a field of half a degree. If your telescope can just fit the moon in, then your true field is going to be um, half a degree with that eyepiece telescope combination. The other things, exit pupil size and eye relief, I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, magnitude, magnification is M. So the way you work out the magnification is you take the focal length of the telescope divide by the focal length of the eyepiece and that gives you your magnification. But um, basically aperture is the most important thing is already measured. Obviously a bigger aperture you get more light coming in and it's not only more light but as you increase the aperture you actually increase the resolution as well. That may not be quite so obvious, but the formula there, basically the angle, the minimum angle you can see or separate on the, on the sky is approximately 1.22 times the wavelength of the light. So for visual light, you're probably looking at green. And then you divide that by the aperture of the telescope. So the bigger the aperture, smaller the angle gets. So you can see finer and finer detail. We won't um, give an explanation of where this formula comes from. It basically um, comes from various investigations into optics. Okay, so um, aperture is the best, so you've got two things counting against it, well, three things really. You, how much can you afford? Because generally a bigger lens or mirror is going to cost more. Um, you've got the um, sky conditions. If you haven't got good sky conditions at home and to see things, you've got to transport your telescope in your car. So big consideration is how big the telescope you can fit in your car or whatever vehicle. If you've got a truck, you might be able to do better. Um, and it's also a physical thing. It, obviously, it's going to be bigger, it's heavier to move. If you're doing that all the time, you might get sick of moving a big heavy telescope around. So everything like this is a compromise. And you've got possible issues like cool down if you're impatient. You might not like using a big giant mirror telescope. If you want to observe within five minutes, maybe a refractor is more your thing. So let's look at what we can see with... Um, um, various apertures. This is just a guide and it's going to depend on sky conditions and your own vision. But 
for example, a six millimeter aperture, which is roughly your eye. <coughs> fainter star, maybe a little bit fainter than magnitude six. Haven't explained magnitudes. This is a scale that says that the brightest star is about magnitude one. Stars at the limit of what you can see without a telescope or optical aid is about magnitude six. It dates back to the ancient Greeks who used the system. They just ranked stars from first to sixth magnitude. The system is now on a scientific basis and it's been extended both ways. So the sun is about magnitude minus 26 and the faintest galaxies in the James Webb might be minus 34, or, sorry, plus 34, something like that. So the amateur range visually for this, these type of scopes here, depending on the aperture. Um, a half metre mirror, which is roughly a 20 inch telescope, you can go down to 16th magnitude visually under ideal situation. Generally, aperture for aperture, um, a refractor will perform slightly better than a reflector. And the main reason for this is that the uh, refractor doesn't have any central obstruction such as you have in a reflector where you have a secondary mirror with spider, the spider veins cause diffraction and scattering, secondary holders blocking out some of the light so you get loss of contrast from that. But um, <coughs> where the problem comes in with the refractor is that the price goes up a lot faster than it does with reflectors. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Might need some <coughs> water. Okay. Um, there's an online calculator mentioned there where you can put in your sky information, um, telescope, eyepiece and everything like that. And it gives more realistic results in this table. So if you're interested in looking that up, you can um, feed in the data into that website that's relevant to your... Oh, my voice is coming back, sorry. And this is um, basically um, what it looks like at the eyepiece. So, um, oh, thanks, Steve. <laughs> so you see the diffraction pattern. If you hit high magnification, you get this airy pattern of a, um, of a single star. So um, if we've got two stars that are close together, you can see... You can still see that there are two stars in the middle situation there. Um, but in the third situation, particularly if there was any kind of atmospheric disturbance, it's a bit hard to tell that it's two stars anymore. So that's at the limit of your resolution. And it doesn't matter how much you apply more magnification with shorter focal length eyepieces. This is a fundamental limit. You can't overcome it by stacking more magnification on. So there's a couple of um, schemes. There's a little bit of subjectiveness to this um, as to when you can, you're sure or not sure you can separate two stars. So we have two um, uh, limits or criteria for um, deciding on um, on um, at what sort of aperture you can separate these things. There's the rally limit and doors limit. So you can see that doors limit is a little bit more optimistic. So that's just to give you an idea, like the middle one would be roughly like a four inch refractor. Doors says you can almost get down to one arc second, um, but the rally limit says no, you can't quite do that well. And then when you go to 150 millimetres or 6 inch, um, your, um, your um, diffraction limit becomes better than an arc second of, of, um, 
or a better than one arc second. You know, the problem with this is, as we mentioned before, you might be lucky on a really good night to get one arc second of seeing. So it doesn't matter now how big your mirror is, you're not going to overcome the seeing because of the atmosphere. And this is why you, um, astronomers like to put telescopes in the high plateau in Chile or, in, or even better in space because then you don't have the atmospheric seeing competing with the resolution limit of the telescope. So basically at ground level, you're not going to get more resolution than you can get out of a 6-inch refractor. Even if you go to a 20-inch mirror, it's still not going to get better resolution because of the seeing, not because of the physics of the telescope. A um, couple of examples. We have a, um, a Dobsonian, Astron's Dobsonian, 8-inch, 200 millimeter focal ratio f6. So you can easily calculate what the focal length is from the above two numbers. So you multiply 200 by 6 to work out the focal length of the telescope. And from that, you have your eyepiece will normally have the focal length printed on it. Um, so you just divide the two numbers to get the magnification. So why do you want high magnification? You generally use that for looking at fairly bright things like planets um, where you want to see a lot of detail or the, or the moon um, where you might want to look at um, craters and things like that. So um, for deep sky objects, so you usually don't want high magnification. You're actually uh, much better off with a lower magnification. So if you're looking at galaxies or nebula, um, don't sort of go to 400 power or something like that. It's, um, the other thing is as you crank up the power, the field of view goes down. So if the star cluster or galaxy you're looking at is bigger than the field of view, then you're not going to be able to see, even see all of it. And often with galaxies, you need a bit of black sky background to get enough contrast to actually see them, even from a dark sky site. So this is just a quick um, uh, mention of um, apparent field of view and true field. So we're looking at it through the telescope eyepiece and imagine that this is what you can actually see. So that area of sky, um, and that's been generated from Stellarium, which has an ocular plug-in where you tell it what telescope and eyepiece you're using, and then it will show you the field, the actual field of view on the sky that you can see with that eyepiece telescope combination. So. If you're doing observing planning, it's quite useful to do this. Um, get your um, stellarium out during the evening before you go out observing and think, okay, this is the things I'm going to look at. What, what would be a good eyepiece to use? So, um, and the, the apparent field, as I said, is to do with the eyepiece design. And you can have three different eyepieces at the same focal length. So they're giving you the same magnification, but the, um, the teleview ethos with a 100 degree apparent field, you can just see a, a bit more sky at the same magnification. And um, there's a huge difference in price, like the PLOS is probably, I don't know, sub $100, and the ethos is probably going to cost you $1,000, something, something of that order. And um, you can calculate the true field if you know the apparent field stamped on the eyepiece divide by the magnification, which you've already calculated. And that will tell you the true field of view. So an example here, we've got a 25mm um, a, a plus, so that's 50 degree apparent field. And we have, a, again, the same F6, 200mm Dobsonian. Um, we work out the magnification of that combination. It's 48 times. So we divide into the apparent field stamped on the eyepiece 
and it's about one degree. These, the number for the um, apparent field may not be exact, so there can be a little bit of plus or minus in there. Um, the other thing to worry about for visual observing is eye relief, and this mainly affects people who wear eyeglasses to observe. So what the eye relief is, is how far you need to have your the cornea, if you like, positioned from the, the last element of the eyepiece at the point at which you can still see the entire field of view. So if you have a short eye relief, you have to get closer. And that's a problem if you're wearing eyeglasses because you may not be able to do that. The thing is, if you're like me and you just need glasses for reading, you don't need glasses um, to view at the telescope because that issue can just be changed by adjusting the focus. But if you have astigmatism or any other um, optical problem like that, and you have to wear eye glasses for that, the telescope can't, can't adjust for that, so you may have to wear your eyeglasses to observe. So it means you want eyepieces that have long eye relief. And the manufacturer will tell you what the eye relief of the eyepiece is. Um, Possils tend to have the short, shorter the focal length, the shorter the eye relief. So you might be fine looking at a wide field with eyeglasses with, say, a 30 millimetre plossil. But if you go down to a 5 millimetre one at high magnification, you may not be able to really use it with eye, if you have to wear eyeglasses. But if you can afford it, buy an eyepiece with long eye relief if you need to wear eyeglasses. I've sort of talked about this stuff. Oh, yeah, the, the other trick you can, if you found you, you didn't want to buy another, uh, you buy one of these fancy um, short focal length eyepieces, you can use a Barlow lens, which is fairly inexpensive. And if you use that with a long focal length eyepiece, the Barlow lens doesn't change the eye relief of the eyepiece, but it increases the apparent magnification. So this is a trick you can use if, say, you wanted to observe at 15 millimetres and you had a 30 mil eyepiece that was comfortable for you to use with eyeglasses. Slap a Barlow in there, you can go to double the magnification and it's still comfortable to use with eyeglasses. Um, exit pupil is sort of a, um, can be a technical issue as you get older. Um, the exit pupil is the diameter or the aperture of the telescope divided by the magnification you're using. So the higher the magnification, the exit pupil gets smaller, which is okay. But if the exit pupil is larger than, say, 6 millimetres, what it means is that some of the light um, being focused by the telescope is not going to be, or the eyepiece telescope combination is not going to enter your pupil. So you're not getting the full benefit of, the, of your setup. And because your pupil size um, gets smaller as you get older, um, it means that you are more and more restricted to using wide, wide field eyepieces because you um, are going to start losing some of the brightness of the image. Um, if you're worried about it, you can do the calculation not sure exactly how you can easily measure your pupil size. Get somebody to take a photo in the dark or something before you, your eye can re react with a flash. Um, just a few little points on viewing particular objects. Already mentioned for planets, high magnification. So the, for um, observing the sun, is safety is the chief and uh, consideration. Obviously, if you are putting a large aperture telescope aimed at the sun, you're going to have a dangerous um, concentration of light. Um, so, some of the old time department store scopes used to sell a filter that you put on the eyepiece. Those things are dangerous. And don't don't ever do that. <laughs> if you're going to observe with a um, um, like a small refractor, you need 
an aperture filter that covers the, um, the objective lens completely. Um, it's the only really safe way to do it um, with, a, with just with an ordinary telescope. So um, you can actually make these yourself. You can buy sheets of um, certified solar film from Beta Planetarium in um, Germany. You can order it online. It's not that expensive. So you can cut pieces out and put it in a holder. Um, one thing you must be really careful with this film is that you don't damage it because that if you make a like a pinhole in it or something, it's going to let the full brightness of the sun through. So you've got to make sure you're careful with it. But a lot of amateurs make their own of these filters out of this film. Some people in the old days used to use welding glass. If it's good quality welding glass, you could use that. If you go to a really um, high um, um, density one that's used for um, arc welding, that blocks out all the dangerous frequencies. Um, you can get specialised solar telescopes. The Society owns one, which I think Mitchell has got on loan at the moment. And that's specifically designed for observing the sun. But the way that works, it has what's called a um, hydrogen alpha, fil alpha filter, which is a narrow band filter. So it only lets a very narrow colour of the light coming from the sun get through. And it has a blocking filter as well. Um, I think the one we've got is stack. So there's actually two of the H alpha, fil H alpha, alpha filters. And you can adjust them so that you can adjust the particular wavelength you're looking at on the sun. Um, so you can, um, the, the, the light um, is slightly different depending on Doppler shift effects on the sun's uh, surface or photosphere, so you, it's quite fun to play with that. And you can see quite a lot of detail with those. So um, if your scope has got a finder on it, don't be tempted to look through it at the sun, put a cap on it and leave it there. If you've got a fairly small aperture scope, one option is um, use it with a cheap expendable eyepiece because the eyepiece will get hot and you're doing what's called eyepiece projection, you don't have a filter. Because of that, you want a fairly small aperture scope, maybe 80 millimetres, something like that. Won't harm the objective, but it's concentrating a lot of light where the eyepiece is. So the eyepiece could be one that you don't mind being destroyed, and you don't look through it. What you do is you hold up a piece of card, and it will project the image of the sun onto the card. Um, that, I did that myself quite successfully with the transit of Venus. So you could see the shadow of Venus crossing the sun back in 2012. I don't know if any of you were interested in astronomy back in those days when it happened. It was a big event in New Zealand. And this, well, this hem whole hemisphere of the Earth. Well, not discovered it. Um, Captain Cook um, was ordered to go to the South Pacific to observe a transit of Venus. And the, the big deal about it is that it, accurate timing of when the shadow of the planet um, enters the um, solar disk and exits, you have when the edge of Venus is, just comes onto the sun and then when the trailing edge just comes onto the sun and the same on the exit. You can use those... Sorry? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, that was something that they discovered. Um, I think there's still some debate about exactly what causes it, but if you can get really accurate timings of those things, you can actually figure out the distance to the sun to high accuracy. If you do it in several places on the Earth's surface... Wasn't good enough. Yeah, yeah, there is a problem with it because it's actually hard to judge the exact timing of those two events. They call it the, the ink drop or the black drop effect. It's just sort of a period where the, you're uncertain about whether it's there or not there or it's actually cleared the edge of the sun. So um, there's a lot of stories about it. Like there was one French guy, I think, who got sent to India um, and then he got to some place where he couldn't go any further because the war broke out. And then he decided not to go home because the next one was going to be um, somewhere else, like Indonesia or somewhere that he was going to be able to 
um, observe it. He got there and it was cloudy. <laughs> and then he, the guy got home finally and then they'd, uh, he found that his estate had been sold off. He'd been declared dead because so <laughs> he had disappeared for such a long time. Yeah, I'm, I, there is, um, it's worth looking at Googling about it because it still meant you could get quite a decent um, measurement but um, not good enough for a really high accuracy. Um, it's a bit off topic but the way it's done now is using radar. They basically um, fire aim radar at near Earth asteroids and then get an accurate distance from those and then from Kepler's laws and that radar measurement, you can calculate the scale of the whole solar system to quite high accuracy. Um, yeah, so that we were talking about eyepiece projection. Um, and this, again, reiterate, don't use eyepiece filters, they're dangerous. Because they're going to get really hot. And if the thing shatters and your eye happens to be there, it's, it's not, not really good. Um, observing the moon is... Um, if, if there's a bright full moon, you're probably not going to be observing galaxies. So if you can't beat them, join them and observe the moon. But the full moon isn't that great for observing because um, to see a lot of detail on the moon, it's better around this time when it's near quarter phase because then you've got a lot of shadows that actually delineate all the craters. So it's quite cool to look at the moon around this time actually or or if you want to wait till after midnight, after the third quarter. So, um, but it doesn't have to be exactly on a quarter phase. A few days either side, two or three days either side is kind of the best to see detail. But when you're looking at it, it will ruin your dark adaptation. So either do the moon last or do it first, but then expect to wait for your eyes to adapt again. Yeah, you can. They're called neutral density filters, so they're not a particular colour. They just um, dim the view, so it means you can observe the moon without it dazzling you so much. And quite often when you buy a telescope, will come with eyepieces and maybe one of these lunar filters, as they're called. And they just basically screw onto your eyepiece. They're usually one and a quarter inch eye, uh, filter thread. Um, for planets and the moon, obviously, you don't have to be dark adapted. And you can see the planets from the centre of Auckland, no problem. And they're bright enough that the light pollution doesn't really cause you any issue. And because there's detail to be seen here and there's plenty of light, this is a case where you ramp up the magnification with a shorter focal length eyepiece. Now, um, another issue when you're looking at fainter objects, such as galaxies especially, don't look directly at the object. Remember I showed you that diagram at the beginning showing the retina and how the, the colour um, receptors are concentrated in the most sensitive area of your vision, at the fovea and the macula area. Um, whereas the Outer areas are mostly rod cells, which are the more light sensitive and dark adapt better. So instead of looking directly at the object, um, get used to a, sort of a bit like looking at something in the corner of your eye. It takes a bit of practice to do it, and you'll find that galaxies will pop out in the in the outer part of your vision, where you may have trouble seeing them in the central part of your vision. So that's a little technique called um, averted vision. And uh, um, we can probably have a play with that up in the Zeiss. Um, uh, we can kick Alex off. He's using his camera on it at the moment. If anyone wants to have a look, we can look at maybe um, the Sombrero galaxy and uh, you'll find that with averted vision, it, it's easier to see. So uh, planetary nebula... Um, they are interesting because they cover a wide range of surface brightness. Some of them are bright enough to actually see colour, like the ghost of Jupiter, 
or the blue planetary nebula, you can actually see those visually as a coloured object, whereas most nebula just looks like a shade, um, various um, levels of grey. So these small bright ones like that, you can ramp up the magnification a bit on those and bring out some detail. Um, some of them though are actually low surface brightness and cover quite a large area of sky and um, one that people like a lot is the Helix Nebula, I think in Aquarius, is that right? Can anyone remember? I think it's in Aquarius. Anyway, um, it, it covers 25 arc minutes of sky and um, so you actually need a wide field of view and it's actually better to look at it in a relatively small aperture telescope. Um, in the Zeiss, a, with a wide angle eyepiece, it'll completely fill the field of view and it's really difficult to see it because there's not enough contrast, um, especially with the sky glow here. You can see it out in rural sky with quite a small telescope or even binoculars. And already talked a bit about um, averted vision with nebula and galaxies. So, but you're better to get away from the city for these because the surface brightness is just going to be overwhelmed by the sky glow. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Um, if you want to stay around for a bit, we'll adjourn upstairs and um, have a wee look through the Zeiss telescope. So thanks everyone for coming along. <laughs>